Hello, everybody. Welcome along to this little talk. Um, I hope you guys are looking forward to talking about infrastructure. What a fun word. Um, so I am uh, this guy. Um, I should be more specific. I'm that one. Um, I'm Niall Dehan. I'm a consultant, and I go around uh, building things on top of Kamunda and uh, helping people understand how to use it in various ways. Um, the bird uh, in question, uh, named by public vote, is Hockey McHawkface, of course. Um, so um, I want to really talk about how we're actually how it's possible to use um, Kamunda um, and basically how to use certain architectures um, and have this layer that is basically infrastructure that gives you a lot more than just being able to have to build something with a bunch of different systems all talking together and relatively anonymous things happening in between them. Um, I am not a particularly... Um, uh, I'm not a particularly obsessed person with different types of architectures. Um, generally speaking, something uh, things are either microservice, in which case everything has their own domain, which is perfectly fine, their own data sources, completely independent. In fact, they have things like independent, independent components, which is really, really handy. It makes sure that everything is totally separated. I really like the idea of um, having separate people be able to give a domain so they can deploy things when their microservice needs to. I love the idea of decoupled um, components because because I don't like the idea of having to rely on another microservice before you can do something. And of course, I also like um, uh, the, 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 the ability to be able to decide, in my microservice, we're going to use a certain data source and a certain language and so on. So I do like microservices. They're really fun. I build loads of stuff with those. But uh, there is also kind of these nice benefits to the what would be seen as an older style system, where you have a centralized point where you have total visibility, you actually know what happens and what has happened and probably what will happen because it's all contained in the same place. Uh, you can actually monitor that and that means that you can see the history of things. You can also handle errors in one place, which is really, really handy. Deal with retries in one place. So I actually quite like um, certain aspects of both. There are also, of course, downsides to both. With microservices, I don't quite like the idea that I'm not really sure what has happened. When an error gets formed, I have to trace backwards, being what services have been called, what, where did the error really occur? It's a bit of a bit of an issue. So um, on, if we were to have a little scale between um, centralized, well, I'm going to say BPM, I guess, and these new sort of entirely event-driven stuff, my personal preference is kind of somewhere in there somewhere sort of closer to uh, microservices, um, uh, definitely further away from centralized stuff, but I want to keep some of that stuff that centralization gave us. Um, one thing I really like, of course, is the idea that we can just, a microservice is just in charge of sending an event, and it has some sort of payload, and then we just need to um, uh, th have this layer somewhere in between that deals with how we're actually going to deal with that event and what's going to happen next. And of course, these guys are not supposed to know about each other in any sense, or really know about that little layer in the middle. Um, so I want to show you guys a little simple architecture that um, is, uh, that allows you to build infrastructure in a really easy way. And it looks kind of like this. So the idea is that you can have your service, you have your independence, all your business logic are these services. Okay, So they can be written in whatever, they have their own domain language, their own data source if they want it. And what we have, what connects these guys is uh, what some people might call an orchestrator, but it's basically the state management, the event management, the history, the everything that's happened between all this. And so Commanda is an open source um, uh, orchestration or a workflow engine that allows you to uh, build uh, and model your infrastructure and how your services or how your processes are going to work, deploy them, and then it just runs that way. It's, it's quite, quite easy, actually. And um, generally, these models here, BPMN, is kind of how it works. And I'm actually going to build this infrastructure just now in a, about three slides time from scratch. So I'll start off these services, I'll build my infrastructure, and I'll have it all basically running. But as I said, this will be a live demo, so I We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, I, I, before I even start, I'm going to say it worked an hour before this presentation. Okay, so I just get that in early. So um, uh, Commanda itself is this little engine guy here. It's got loads of tools around it. An important thing that you should know is that this is not the only architecture in which Commanda happens to be used. It's one that I quite like and I tend to end up building. So um, uh, we'll have more sort of a uh, brief discussion about other ways of using it later on. But the idea here is that I do not want any business logic in my orchestration layer. I want that all separate. I want that all versionable separately. I don't want my, the change in how my process runs to affect 
anything that else is running, including services that start my processes and services that continue it. And as I said, Comunda has a bunch of tools and things we'll look at um, for um, basically observing what's happening and reporting on what's happening and fixing problems and things. So for this little architectural fun thing, I'm going to actually get some requirements first of all, of course, like every good project. And uh, the first one, very, very simple. I'm going to keep adding some requirements to this. So the very first one is uh, we want to order something. It can either be hardware or software. And it can, uh, it can sometimes be free of charge. Because uh, as I said, Comunda is open source, and it's a software. So if you want to, uh, you can go download that. I'll be talking about it a little later on. And you can use what I'm going to show you just now um, um, pretty easily, and maybe even can contribute back to the uh, code base. So this means from an, a design perspective, we want to actually get these services running. That could be a total separate thing. Our services, where they are, doesn't really matter. The, they are a separate thing. They should be running somewhere. Uh, then we need to make sure that these services are called in, a, in the correct order, depending on criteria. For instance, if something is hardware, I need to reserve that physical thing in the warehouse. If something needs to be paid for, I need to make sure the pay service is called. And that involves taking data from one microservice and calling another one with that dependency. It's pretty easy. So let's see if I can get through this. So let's see if we can build it. So um, let's start here. So the first thing is that this is a little JavaScript modeler. What this is doing is it's allowing me to build BPMN 2.0. It's, it's an open standard for describing how processes work. And you can basically use this for doing something like building this little guy, say, Let's say uh, decide on item type. So we'll find out whether it's hardware, whether it's software, whether it's free, whether it's not. And depending on the result of that, I'm just going to um, have an inclusive gateway here, meaning that we will either go up here if it's hardware. OK. Uh, we could also go this way. That's the wrong symbol. There we go. It also go this way if it uh, needs payment. OK, and then we'll just join those guys back here in this gateway here. So now what I've done here is not design um, some sort of, uh, oh yeah, I need to actually give these guys a proper service task. Great. So this is going to be a reserve in warehouse. And this is going to be um, needs uh, make payment, maybe. OK, and that should be a service task as well. There we go. OK, so what I'm designing here is actually not just some little picture. Um, this is an executable uh, model. It's a um, little XML tab in the bottom right. Shows that there's a bunch of XML. This is standard BPMN 2.0. Our engine basically understands that. It can turn that into a state machine, more or less. And also it can handle events and all sorts of other fun stuff. So uh, now let's talk about what these services are. OK, so we have this layer. This is where we're going to call things. This is a very simple example. We'll get more complex. But this is the, the opening gambit where we have these things. We want to call them in this order. So where are our services? So my services look like this, OK? They're a little JavaScript guy. They have a location of a REST endpoint. OK, which is where the engine is running. It knows where the engine is. And it knows what work it can do, OK? That's all it knows. It doesn't know about the process itself. It doesn't know about the task that needs to be done. It just knows there is a central component that if I ask, that's where I get my work. It's up to the, um, the engine to decide what happens when this guy finishes the task and how the process gets rooted further. So I'm just going to start these guys up. I have them here. There is item type. Do do do. That guy there, and that guy there. OK. So if I start these guys up, they will do not much more than polling. OK? They're just asking for work to do. And right now, there is no work to do. So now we actually need to add a bit more to this and then give it to the engine. So right now, what I've designed can be done by basically anybody. If I actually want to make this run, I need to give it a few additional criteria. And that's all here in the properties panel. Um, there's lots of, as I mentioned already, this is one way of implementing things. I could just attach a Java class to this, and then it would run that Java class. But personally, I don't like that approach straight away, because it means that I have to have code 
very close, so it's class loadable near my, um, in, on this container. I don't really want that, so I'm going to use external. I'm not going to trust my own spelling, so I'm going to copy this. So this says that when we arrive, when our process arrives at the state, when our token is at that point, we are at the point where we're writing to a topic to say, OK, now we need this work done. This determined status needs to be done. Okay, along with the context of the current instance, we have this um, topic. And the worker basically is going to say, okay, that's for me, I'll do that. Okay, and we'll do that for the rest of these little guys. So, reserving warehouse is this one here. Oopsie, that's the wrong button. Okay, so once again, external, great. Make payment, this guy here. Again, external. And now I just need to give this an actual name which is um, an ID of my process, so I can actually start it. OK, and as I said, I'm just going to save this to my desktop, because this is basically uh, just, an, just a, a simple um, doo -doo -doo. It's a simple little XML file. And what's going to make this run is the fact that I'm going to uh, deploy it to this. So this is the front end that represents Comunda. Uh, this is a fresh install, so I just this is what you would see if you just downloaded it. We have a single little demo process that's running here. It looks something like this. And of course, I want to deploy my new process to this. OK? And once it's deployed, that basically gives it this REST endpoint will then be able to be fired off and uh, started. So let's just go to deployments. And I just need to find that file. And then we basically get our, our infrastructure. We get our, our, our state machine from what we designed. I'm going to type something very important in here. Great. OK, so if I refresh this, we then have something very simple, which is we have this. OK, and now we can actually start this. This is now a live running process. So I can go to uh, Postman here, and I can just send a REST call to the engine to say, if you have a process with this key, cam delivery, then just start an instance of it. So I can just do that, and that gets sent. Great. Meanwhile, our workers are doing all sorts of weird stuff. Because I started this, it moved the process on. We found that we basically started here. We did something here. Presumably, we then, with the, with the database here, we arrived either here, here, or both. We could do either. And then we arrived at the end. Now, the nice thing is that that definitely happened, because we know how it works. But we don't have to trust my word for it, because we also have history of exactly what happened. So this actually shows the path that we've actually taken so far. So if we do something like start up a runner, so this is a really simple runner that's going to start this process lots and lots of times. Um, well, not lots and lots, 20. Um, let's run that. So this is now starting the process with data. And all of these little worker guys are working away. And they're all perfectly independent. And they can die pretty easily. So I can kill the item worker, for instance. That can go down. And I can refresh this. And we can then see how we've done so far. We uh, got six guys went through here. This is starting to pile up, probably. There's two there. So if I refresh this, my other two workers are still running, but they don't have any job to do. So I just need to go back to my item worker here and just start him back up. So not only can they die and be started back up without actually affecting the state of our process, which is a really nice thing to have. As soon as it starts back up, it just gets the software and starts going again. Because it's independent, because it has no requirement that uh, Commander stays up, and Commander has no requirement that this stays up. So it means that we can then suddenly take off again and start going where we left off, and all state is maintained here. OK. So that's a pretty easy example. That's pretty straightforward. Um, but um, let's just pop back here, and let's talk about the um, fundamental problem with when you write something that's simple and great. Um, uh, we get new requirements. We need to add to it. We need to improve it, because we never need to have to deal with the one thing. So let's say. We have some new requirements. We need to wait for some confirmation from our user, because after we've done all this, we would like to make sure that they actually want something. But we don't want to wait too long. We don't want to wait forever. Okay? So we need to wait for a certain amount of time to expire, and then we're just going to give up waiting. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to wait for an external message to come in, and we're going to uh, wait for about 20 minutes. We're going to make it two minutes for this demo. And then we're going to um, make this change without disturbing anything. 
We don't want to, we have a running process, it's very, very popular now, and we don't want to have to change any, we don't want to have to stop our service just because we're changing some stuff. So, for instance, if I open my runner back up, I'm going to go back here. I'm actually going to run this maybe 200 times. I'm just going to kick it off. Hopefully, it'll work OK. And I'll have that running in the background and then improve and deploy my new process. So that'll be starting processes the whole time. And these guys will all be running, doing their work. And meanwhile, I'm just going to add something to this. I'm going to add another task. This is a different type of task. It's a receive task. So wait for confirmation. OK. But as I said, I don't want to wait too long. So I'm actually going to add a timer to this. So as well as just being able to maintain state, the engine also uh, has asynchronous processing behind the scenes. So it can do all sorts of really fun stuff, like it can start processes every X number, uh, X amount of time. If, this, if we are live at this point, we can wait for a certain time to expire, and then we'll move in a different direction. And we don't need our microservice to worry about that or any other part of the system. It's all taken care of by the engine. So let's say... Two minutes. Two minutes is very short, but so is this talk. So there we go. This suits great. So um, I'm going to add a message to this. So this is the message we're going to be waiting for. Confirmation. Great. And we're waiting for a certain time to expire, which would be a duration. I'm going to give it PT2M. Normally, you would put an expression in there. You don't want to hard code anything, but there we are. So what do we do now that we have our new model? We have all our services running happily doing their own thing. And we have uh, this guy here, an external system, you can imagine, like a website. You're just constantly ordering more stuff. So how do you get this thing to actually um, pick off? Well, we go back here to our deploy. We click this. We click on the thing we just created, which I assume I saved. I did. And click deploy. OK, great. So now that's it. That's it done. If I refresh this page. We should see, actually, that we probably have a few instances maybe floating around there. We don't, but we do have this little drop down here. We do have a new version. And not only do we have a new version, we have instances running this new version because this call that's been made was starting the new, just start this process. We never specified in this REST call anything about a version because we don't want an external system to be trapped to a specific version of orchestration. Rather, it just says start whichever one is new, and it just does that. So instead, we have a scenario where we just can add these changes, deploy them, and no microservices or no, no services are actually affected by this. And any services starting the process, any sort of messages in, don't really have any problems either. So let's just stop that for a moment. No okay, dokie. Okay. So let's uh, have we look at this. No okay, dokie. Okay. So um, yeah, let's actually have a we look at cockpit. So if I refresh this, I've killed. Um, a bunch of stuff. So there's also, as I mentioned already, some things we can maybe do uh, to like sort of ad hoc admin stuff here. It's quite nice to look at it, okay, and it's, it looks very pretty. Um, but it's it's not really it's an admin tool. This uh, front end. It's talking to the engine. We can see what's actually happened, but we can also manipulate state in a really important way. So let's imagine that we have a problem. We get a call and we get a problem with, let's say, one of the processes is waiting for confirmation, but actually. Um, for some reason, um, they use a diff the wrong item in the tick box or something. So here we have all the details. We have hardware, yes. And let's say it wasn't actually hardware at all. So I'm going to change this to no. OK, that's easy enough. I've changed the process variable because we have all the variables right there. But that doesn't really help because we've already gone through the process. So the nice way, of the, 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 one of the really nice uh, features we have here is the ability to manipulate state at this level very easily without affecting the processes. So for instance, I can just decide, I would like to run this again, but from over here. So I can drag the state and then drop it to any other position in the model, either before uh, its current location or after. And I can just decide, OK, apply that. We get this lovely message. You are playing with fire. In Commander, if you are about to do something cool, you will see this message. Um, and it means that something might break. In this case, and it didn't. So it moved through. It then probably ran a bunch more stuff. Let's check the history. OK. So this instance, what this shows is quite interesting. It shows, first of all, the audit log is here, so I know exactly what happened at what time. But I can also see that we started the process here. We then did this twice. Okay. We arrived here. We did these two twice. 
we arrive back, four tokens right here, and then we're back here. What this little guy here indicates is that we got here before, but we never actually completed this state. Okay, so all of the state information is maintained, and it's all changeable here, again, because we have this separation between our services that we don't need to worry too much, and we can manipulate data and stuff from here. Okie dokie, so let's move on to something a little more complicated, a little more interesting. So, okay, next up, we made a teeny problem. Okay, this does happen, as you may know. We have problems with our services that we've just deployed something. It's very, very easy to change your process, which means it's maybe a little bit too easy to change your process. So we have a problem in which, if you look at our model, we could possibly make uh, charge people, okay, reserve something in the warehouse, and then when they make confirmation, uh, if they don't make confirmation in time, we could end up just forgetting about it, and we've actually not done anything to solve this payment problem. So we're charging a bunch of customer stuff. And because this is very, very popular, let's start up, it keeps on running. So we, this process is right now uh, causing all sorts of havoc. So again, one of the nice things about this centralized uh, way of doing things is that I can go into my process that I know is not working very well uh, because for various reasons and I can decide okay uh, I could shut down all my microservices that would definitely work that would mean that I wouldn't be doing this anymore but it's a little bit drastic so instead I'm going to go back over here and I'm just going to say um, let's say runtime there we go I'm just going to pause okay I'm going to just say stop this process pause everything in the current state it's in don't start any new ones this is just, this is now, this is not working. And the nice thing is that, all our, as I said, all our microservices, they just adhere to that. It freezes the state of the current process. Okay, so all those guys have stopped. Our runner is probably failing. Yep, there we go, it's failing, uh, specifically because it doesn't actually, uh, it's not allowed to start a process that's suspended. And, um, and we can control when these suspensions happen and how to lift them. Um, if you're wondering about the, um, the relationship between this front end and Commanda, this front end is uh, written in um, Angular, I think, probably. Yes, definitely. And it communicates to the engine via REST. It's on the same container. It's on, like, in this case, it's on, uh, along with the engine, which is written entirely in Java. It's, uh, it's got a REST API built on top of that. And all of this communication, including dragging and dropping that token, suspending a process, doing all of that, including deploying a process, is all done by REST. So you can either re you can do it yourself um, in a, with the REST API, or you can use this uh, front end as well. You can embed the engine, or you can also deploy it with this front end. Um, okay, so now let's uh, try and solve our problem. Our problem is, of course, that if we take a look at this. Okay, we need if, if, now here's a fun thing. If we have m made a payment, we have to refund it. And if we've reserved it in the warehouse, we also have to release it, okay? And now why that's interesting is because we have a, um, we have a scenario in which it is possible that we could do either both of these or one of these or either. So we actually don't know at this point which one we have done, okay? That's another important thing. And the nice thing is that um, to actually, this is a, a classic compensation issue. I need to know that if I arrive at this point that I will be able to undo this if I happen to have made a payment during this process. Okay, now there's a very long-winded way of doing this. I could have another gateway. I could maybe query the engine and find out where it's been, and then I could maybe try and run their task to undo it. But BPMN, the reason we use BPMN like this is because it has a lot of really, really great features, like one of them being, if I attach this event here, it's called a compensation event, and I attach this little task here, and I call this release item, Okay, and then I add this event here. Okay, this means that if the state reaches that top corner there, that event, it will check where it has been and it'll check what services it's actually run, like this guy right here that it's run. And it'll say, oh, I've run this and therefore I shall run this. Okay, now usually if you're talking about microservices, these two guys, these, um, the release item and the make reservation, that could be the, that's probably the same service, it's the same domain, right? So it could be the same microservice, in this case it is. The same microservice is polling for multiple things it can do because that's the, the warehouse service is its domain. So 
Um, and I'm going to add another one for payment as well, because now it's possible once we, where's it gone? There it is. Once we throw this event, not only do we go back and throw, let's say a refund. Okay. Not only do we go back and run these guys, uh, we'll also run all of the required um, uh, compensation by default. We don't have to, but we will in this case. So we'll go back and find everywhere we've been that has this symbol and run the, the, the refund. So let me just, um, and again, this is implemented in the same way. We'll use these guys and I will make sure I can copy this. So this is release item. And this one here is make refund. Okay. Great stuff. So now I'm going to um, start this guy back up. Let's actually go back here. Let's run it like 20 times, maybe. And there we go. Great. So that started probably failing. Yep. But have no fear. Um, our services actually don't know about any of this because they're still on their own little weird little plane. So let's drop all those guys. And now I just go back and I'm going to, uh, again, redeploy this. So click on deployment. Choose this. There we go. Type something important. There we go. Deploy. And um, now I think what should happen is that this should start working. There we go. Because we've now deployed something that is not suspended, the newest version is no longer suspended. So if we go here, we can see able to see that there's a bunch of stuff happening um, here. And uh, let's just take a look at history, see what's happened. So these have started. Everything's starting back up. OK. Now, that's quite nice. We have that working, but that does not help us with our broken build here. OK, these guys are, uh, these 60 guys are stuck because they're in this broken build. And so what can we do about this? Um, again, it's quite easy because we maintain all state. We have the possibility to do something like this. If I click on it, yep, there we go. That little subtle button basically does migration. So this on the left is the old version. This on the right is the new one. And we've automatically mapped uh, well, the engine zone as a favor and told us where we probably want to put these tokens. Uh, we don't have to. Uh, if you want, you can be a bit crazy and decide to map this one, I don't know, over here maybe, if you like. Um, it's not really a problem. Um, but this guy here is moving to here. So then I can go ahead. And I can look, filter which ones I want to move. I'll just move them all. Um, yep. Uh, I can do it asynchronously if I like. Once again, we know we're about to do something cool. And um, I can do it asynchronously if there's hundreds of thousands of instances and just execute that. And now they migrate to the new version. And now they're able to deal with this problem of compensation quite easily because they're now in the new version, which has the same history and is able to do that. OK, so now we have a very, very simple way of being able to build all of this infrastructure between our microservices. And what do we get? We get a really nice way of handling the, the path that we've taken and a really nice history view of what's actually happened. And I wonder if any of these have run yet. Apparently not. So that's, to me, a really great benefit. We keep a certain amount of the microservice principle, not all of it, because microservices don't like anything that's centralized. But we have enough of a microservice principle to say that everyone does have their own domain language. I happen to be using JavaScript for these workers. But of course, as we know, because this worker is just a REST call to an engine, it can actually kind of be doing anything it likes. So it can, it can actually be in C Sharp and stuff. And we have all sorts of other languages and Java as well, if you happen to like that, which I suspect you might. OK. So yeah, and there we go. We've actually run 10 of these have fired. And we can see that they've then gone ahead and run these. And all sorts of fun worker stuff is going on in the background. OK. So that's sort of how we can do that. But there's also one more sort of level to this. And this involves, um, this has a lot of data it's produced. OK. Stepping through each of these has given us um, all sorts of weird stuff. It's given us. Um, um, uh, 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 variables, it's given us a timing. We know how long everything takes to run. And uh, we can actually visualize that a lot better. And usually a different kind of person would do that. I'm going to see if I can get this working. Let me see if I can open this. So this is, so this is another um, application that I'll just start up. And while it's doing that, I'll just pop in here very briefly and show you what, I'm about to sh we show you what we've been looking at so far. OK, so so far we've been looking at is this architecture in which we have, this is 
the, the container that we're looking at. We're looking at a SQL database, which is maintaining our state. We have the engine built here. We have our REST API. We have task list, which I haven't really bothered with, which is a front end application so that users can complete user tasks with like forms and stuff. Uh, and cockpit is where we're doing all our work. The modeler is here. And we also, what we haven't shown yet is this guy here. So as I said, this produces a whole bunch of data. Uh, loads and loads of data, and that data is a not a uh, loads and loads of data is not the place you want to keep in a SQL database. Okay, uh, you would much rather keep that in something that's scalable and somewhere where you can actually do some sort of re uh, re reporting on. Which is why we have this other little thing on the side there called Optimize, which basically takes all that data from the um, uh, from the engine and puts it in Elasticsearch, and then gives you this ability to visualize what's happened for usually aimed at non-technical users. But um, that's just because it's read-only and they can't break anything. Um, so let's uh, see if that started up okay. Okay, looks all right. Okay. This has been giving me a bit of hassle, so we'll see if it worked. Okay, so this already got the data we needed, and uh, this is the versions that we have of this process, and this is what we saw. So we can now see something really simple, like where was the most common path through our process? That's something really simple. Where are most of the tokens went? We only ran 38, so there's not very many instances. Um, and we can also find out about other bits and pieces, like I can filter by what about variables like hardware, for instance. What about just the hardware ones? Where did they go? And we can do that sort of thing. It's kind of, um, and this data is taken and kept in, in the idea is kept for like a much longer term um, than in uh, our SQL database. If I'm here, for instance, and seeing this, and if this is starting like, you know, a couple of um, like hundred instances per second, I cannot store that forever. So I can simply tell this on this right hand side here, I want to keep this data in my SQL database only for about uh, 20 days. And then it'll, the engine will actually go and clean that up and get rid of it if you don't want it. And it'll be left in the Elasticsearch database. Um, a nicer sort of thing I want to show you is uh, this guy here, because it's much easier to see the power of this when you actually have data. We only have about 30 something instances. So here's um, uh, um, another model. It involves hiring somebody. Uh, they apply for a job and over here they either get it or they don't. And once again, we can see, for instance, the frequency, how long we've actually spent on each, ta uh, on where all the tasks went. We saw most of the candidates get rejected here, for instance. Um, and then in the end we get these. But if I'm a specific user, I'm only interested in for instance, this month. That's all I want to know about. But more specifically, I also want to know about this the job that I happen to um, uh, ask about, which would be in departments. So maybe I'm in sales and marketing, which I am definitely not. And no offense to any sales and marketing people. Um, and we have uh, 345 instances, but this is our data. This is now what we can see. Now, while this is really useful to see the most common path through our process, so we can kind of figure out how we might want to um, help that, if to find bottlenecks, you really want to know about duration. And this works as well for like um, straight through processing, which I'll show you shortly. But this shows how long we have actually spent in real time on our process, what takes the longest. And so we can see in the middle here, we have a bit two weeks. Uh, which is quite a while. Uh, on this, uh, we have um, three days on this guy here, and so on and so forth. And so this gives us a really good indication that maybe we should spruce up how we organize a second interview. Okay, But it also could be true to say that conducting a second interview takes maybe a while, maybe a week or two. It's actually this guy here, screening an application should not take three days. That seems like a very, very long time to take. So what we can do is we can just go into um, this guy here, which is where we actually give specific requirements, like um, KPIs. So this should only take two days. Um, this guy here, two weeks is fine, let's say. So now we have a very different heat map, but it's showing uh, real life versus expectations. So I would expect this takes, um, my expectations here are four days and two hours, and it's actually taking, um, yeah, one week. So it's 71% above target. So there's all sorts of really fun stuff that we can do with that. And um, yeah, it might be um, 
it's a, it's a nice amount of data to play with and we can, uh, because of Elasticsearch, we can scale it really easily and get it up and running. As I said, it's also really good for straight through processing. If we have a scenario where we only have, here we have a really simple pr task, these are just all services, no user tasks at all. And we can still go down and take a look at uh, how long they took, right? Because we're still measuring. This took three milliseconds. This guy here took 79, so that might be an issue. And so even if you're technic, if you if you don't have any user tasks or you're not dealing with users themselves, a technical flow can also be um, quite easy to, um, uh, to to visualize in this. And again, we can also then add specific um, uh, requirements for that and also add variables and things. Okay, so let me quickly return to my slide. Do, 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 do. Reporting. Yep. Okay, so the kind of things that we can achieve on this are basically this ability to monitor the operations, okay? We can also deal with versioning really, really easily because what I didn't show you, but it's of course possible, is that I can start up or bring down um, uh, a different versions of microservices very, very easily without ever affecting the flow. Um, we can also deal with timeouts and timing in general, lots of asynchronous processing we can deal with. We get actual visibility on what happened in our, in our flow and to our processes and where we might make improvements. We also allow users to use domain languages uh, that they might, uh, especially in polyglot systems where you have a proper DDD sort of environment where everybody actually has their own requirements for data and whatever, and they're releasing their own endpoints, for instance. And of course, scaling is really easy and performance is really great because now, instead of having to call code at every point. Instead, we could have 20 workers that do the same work, but are just getting all this information, getting all this work to do and doing it um, uh, asynchronously and just telling the engine back when it's done. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, it's not the only way that people use uh, Commanda. Uh, if it is a microservice thing you're interested in, people tend to use something more like this, in which instead of having Commanda in the center, you would actually embed Commanda in the domain and you can maintain basically the service flow um, in another sort of way. So, and uh, yeah, that's good for local orchestration, I guess. So, uh, and um, now I just want to basically tell you guys what you should do, which is, of course, go and download this. Um, uh, everything I showed you is open source except for Optimize, um, but uh, the engine itself is entirely um, open source, and so is the APIs and Cockpit and the modeler and everything there. So, go download it and use it. Um, it, there's a big friendly download button right in the middle of the communda.org webpage, web so uh, click on it. Um, yep, so go, go ahead to communda.org. Um, if you're interested in more stuff, we have lots of things going on. So uh, you can follow us in all sorts of usual outlets. So um, do that. It's, you know, the internet. It's a fun place. Okay, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening to all this. So I have a little, a uh, little over ten minutes for questions. So any questions at all? Yes, yourself. What about uh, security and uh, allowing certain devices to adopt the end goal? Yeah, yeah, sure. Security question. So what about security? How do we deal with that? So Commanda itself is 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 deployed to a uh, a, a server like a classic server. So you can we offer. Um, a basic REST authentication for our REST API, but realistically you can wrap whatever security you use around or with the container and then decide how that communication works. Because it's over REST, there's a lot of options there. It's a basic REST call, so you can use whatever security uh, you want. Um, in terms of, um, we do have a certain amount of authorization and stuff. So for instance, people can shouldn't just be able to Everyone who has access to Commanda shouldn't be able to go in and drag tokens around. That is not good news. So we do have authorization for certain things within Commanda and within and all the rest of, uh, calls that actually happen within Cockpit as well. Uh, but as far as the um, the uh, microservices are concerned, your security is basically up to you. You can decide how that happens. It's kind of a, a w slightly removed from exactly what Commanda does because it's surrounded by a container. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Yes. Other than the, the work of calling for new tasks, are there also uh, options to uh, call the uh, microservices from the DB? 
Oh, absolutely, yeah. So in this particular example, I showed um, uh, a microservice architecture in which Commando waits for services to poll for us. The reason I did that is because in this architecture, I do not want Commando to have to know about endpoints because there's lots of them. In microservices, we don't want to have to rely that a certain microservice will be there and will be active, right? But of course, it's perfectly reasonable to do that. You can really easily do it in a few different ways. Um, if you take a look at um, this guy here, this is our... Uh, the, our fundamental building block for calling services. I selected external. It could be calling a Java class that then goes and calls the service. It could be using a connector that directly calls a REST API. Um, it could be calling a bean with a delegate expression. You have a lot of options here, but uh, personally for this type of um, uh, uh, architecture, I prefer to have that separation using external tasks. But there is, of course, a downside being that you did then do have this polling, which might end up being a bit... Um, um, we usually sort of suggest you have some sort of exponential backoff system sort of from your microservices so they don't find work and maybe every, uh, every poll they just back off for like a certain amount before the next call. Okay, super. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, great stuff. Thanks a lot for uh, listening to me and enjoy the rest of DevOps. <laughs>